Good evening, everyone. I am very honored to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Peter Piat this evening and present him with the Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award, which we have. It is very fitting that Dr. Piat is bringing our EPIC Symposium on Global Health and Security to a close, as we have learned of his work and contributions throughout the year. We began our scholarship by reading The Coming Plague by Laurie Garrett, which discusses Dr. Piat's discovery of the Ebola virus in 1976. We then shifted our focus to the global AIDS pandemic and encountered Dr. Piat's work in the context of his role as the founding executive director of UNAIDS. Dr. Piat has led research on AIDS, women's health, and public health in Africa. He has been a professor of microbiology, an advocate for the poor, and a leader in global health action. Currently, Dr. Piat is the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a professor of global health. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, l'Académie Nationale de Médecine of France, the Royal Academy of Medicine of his native Belgium, and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Royal College of Physicians. He is also the chairman of a small committee called the European Forum for Forward Thinking Activities, providing strategic advice on a range of issues. He has published over 500 scientific articles and 16 books, including his most recent, No Time to Lose, A Life in Pursuit of Deadly Viruses, which I know many of my classmates have gotten signed. Dr. Piat demonstrates the impressive ability to influence multiple levels of the interconnected field of global health, ranging from scientific research to policy making. With that, it is my great honor to present Dr. Piat with the Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award. Dr. Jean Mayer was a nutritionist and past president of Tufts University who worked tirelessly to advance hunger issues through advocacy and research. This award was established to honor practitioners who reflect and embody the dictum of Dr. Jean Mayer, which states scholarship, research, and teaching must be dedicated to solving the most pressing problems facing the world. I think we can all agree that Dr. Piat is doing that and much more. So please join me in recognizing the incredible achievements of our speaker tonight. Recognition of a lifetime of extraordinary achievement, valor, intellect, leadership, and humanitarianism in the global fight against infectious diseases. Can I call upon please Don Turkler, our Associate Provost of our University, who uh, we have the honor of working with and reporting to, and uh, to acknowledge members of our board here as well. The EPIC Symposium, the role of EPIC uh, is really only feasible because of our report to an interdisciplinary structure and because of the support and insight and generosity and beneficence of our board. So um, to those of you who are here, our board members, a deep set of gratitude. Don? So I don't have any prepared remarks because Sherman asked me to do this about five minutes ago. Uh, but on um, behalf of the university and the President of the Provost, I'd like to welcome everyone to this lecture. And um, I think this will be absolutely fabulous. Dr. Piat uh, is an educator, a practitioner, and an activist. Uh, truly um, represents um, uh, Dr. Meyer and his goals and the things that he had uh, established. So, uh, what better? I won't. Uh, I won't waste any time because I know everyone wants to hear from this fabulous virus hunter. And so, thank you very much for coming and welcome to Texas. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Sherman, thank you, Alex, for um, well convincing me to, to come here. But this afternoon was really fantastic. I, I had this uh, encounter, I should say, with the EPI class, and uh, uh, you really uh, recognize some of you, uh, a remarkable group of uh, individuals, and uh, I was impressed by the fact that you have that so many disciplines were sitting in one room. Um, 
kind of seeming to respect each other in terms of uh, that you can study some other discipline and uh, coming up with very um, relevant and um, you know and original uh, questions and, and, and reflections and I, I tried to respond to them but I wasn't able to, uh, to do in all cases because uh, I think what strikes me is that um, you're at the end of your that cycle nearly and I I hope you have more questions now than when you started with the every class. That's that's what uh, uh, what it means to to think about things. So I would say really congratulations to Tufts to um, you know to run such an, an original program because the complex problems of tomorrow and of today will only be solved by a multidisciplinary action. And uh, and I think the Jean Meyer. Um, himself is an example of that. I, I never met him. I, to be honest, I didn't know he was uh, at any official function at the university, but I knew him as a, one of the leading, um, well, activists slash scientists slash policy makers um, in a number of areas in the first place in fighting undernutrition, hunger, let's use the word hunger, but also um, on other um, sometimes politically charged issues. So it's a real honor um, to, to receive this award and also uh, to be uh, with you. So tonight I'm going to briefly give a bit of a broad overview where I think we are in terms of global health and what the challenges of, for the future are. Not that we have solved all the problems of, uh, of the past. And just a very quick overview, we've made a remarkable progress in terms of health over the last, let's say, century, but certainly the last 50 years. And here I just take as an example the evolution of life expectancy uh, at birth uh, in, um, in Asia and, uh, uh, and Australia and, and Oceania. And uh, here this is the picture of 1920. I tried to make this into kind of a movie, but I'm not capable of that. I'm too old for that, I think. <laughs> this, uh, so that, uh, you know, you see here, this is uh, 1920, 1960, 2000, and here we are in 2009, the latest figures. And you see life expectancy has gone up for nearly everybody. But there's also a major shift, um, and that we are reaching now a... Um, a stage where it's um, going to be difficult to further increase life expectancy um, and also I, even if we can, several countries still have some way to go. So unprecedented from a um, historic perspective, uh, unprecedented progress in terms of life expectancy, taking that as a, the, um, an indicator of um, we um, you know, what we can do to improve health. And the question we should ask ourselves is why and uh, what is it you? And um, often people try to identify, let's call them game changers, and there have been game changers, some technological ones, like new vaccines, um, antibiotics, uh, all very new things. Antiretroviral therapy in my own field, I'm working on AIDS as you heard. But also, for the future, a negative one could be antimicrobial resistance. Um, think of untreatable tuberculosis that is uh, now um, emerging. Smoking, the, the industrial production of um, cigarettes and the widespread um, smoking in, in the, first in the Western world, and now more and more in the um, now middle income countries, Asia, Latin America, Africa, has been an absolute game changer of a lethal kind. But now we have an anti-tobacco movement which could reverse this and perhaps a hundred years from now we will look with amazement, we, our grand-grand-grandchildren will look at amazement, how could people do this to themselves? Um, and now we have another game changer, I think, and that is diet changes, and I'll come back to that. But fundamentally, I think this progress is due as much to other factors than, um, 
than let's say what science has given us and the technology. And um, it's a combination of, um, in the middle I would say, um, you know, economic development, empowerment of people, uh, so that they're more masters of their own lives, um, but also politics and uh, delivery systems. And you need all of this to, to make progress. If you have just one, it just purely doesn't work. Science without the politics is nice and interesting, but it's not going to lead anywhere. Politics that's not really, at least somewhat connected to, to evidence, can be very dangerous. And if you don't have the delivery systems on the ground, um, again, people won't benefit from it. But the truth is also that we still have a, uh, an unfinished agenda which is captured to a to large extent in the Millennium Development Goals. But that unfinished agenda where we've made good progress, but it's uh, in terms of maternal mortality, but still about 300,000 women are dying while giving birth. There is absolutely no excuse for that. Um, in terms of under five mortality, great progress. Uh, a few years ago for the first time, less than 10 million children died uh, under five years. I mean, you can see it's still a lot, but good progress. We've made progress in terms of um, fighting AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, but it's still there. Um, and uh, despite what we sometimes see in the media or hear from official speeches, AIDS is not over with 1.7 million deaths last year. Um, and 2.5 million new infections. You can't say that it's over. It's the first cause of death in Africa. But we have a, an escalating world population. Family planning was off the agenda for many years, um, largely due to, I would say, American religious wars. Um, and um, we still have malnutrition. You shouldn't forget that with our obesity. And continuing major health disparities. So that's the unfinished agenda we should not drop. And there, as I said, there, uh, many of these are uh, captured in the Millennium Development Goals, which I think have really made a big difference. For the first time ever, um, all nations, members of the UN, agreed on uh, eight um, goals. And uh, there was a, a coming together of the minds, but also of money uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, these um, Millennium Development Goals. They're not perfect, there are big gaps in there, but uh, the um, recent evidence shows that we have really made um, a, a, a dent in all these um, Millennium Development Goals. Now, something that is definitely um, will continue to um, haunt us, I think, are emerging infections. And um, here, without going into any detail, but you see over the last um, 20 years or so, uh, there have been um, well over 50 new viruses, bacteria, parasites discovered that are affecting people. Most of these are coming from animals. So the whole concept of One Health is not just a, an intellectual concept, it is reality. And um, we'll see more of it. Um, and just if you take the, the flu, something that we all know, um, it originates always in um, you know, poultry, um, in, in uh, swine, you know, in, in um, uh, other uh, animals like other birds. And whereas we thought that it, uh, traditionally it, it always emerges from East Asia and Southeast Asia, Last time it, um, it came from Mexico. And so there are um, more and more, um, there's more and more contact between people and either domesticated animals or uh, wild animals, and that will give rise to new uh, infections in addition to what we, um, um, you know, what we create ourselves by the use of antibiotics. Um, I'm mentioning this not only because I'm an infectious disease guy, but also when you think of um, security, society, and, and health, it's something that in itself may not always um, create um, many deaths, but or cause many deaths, but 
uh, can be extremely uh, disruptive. Think of this like the SARS epidemic about 10 years ago uh, that uh, emerged in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, it killed only, quote unquote, like 400 people, and then uh, there were some cases in Toronto and all that. But um, the, which is far less than the number of people who fell off uh, the stairs in, in, in Asia at the same time. But the economic disruption was enormous. It costed tens and tens of billions of dollars uh, because of disrupted commerce, um, travel, and so on. So that's why we also we need to uh, deal with this, um, these uh, emergency, uh, emerging infections. Now, the world is changing, as we all know, and, and, and you know, I'm sure you're studying this all the time. But just think of uh, where we will be, basically, even by 2020. Um, the uh, power, the center of the universe is moving to, um, to Asia in a big way. Three of the four top economies will be in Asia, and China, Japan, and India. The fourth one is the U.S. still. Um, competition for energy, land, water, and commodities will uh, increase, also because of population pressure. This climate change, which is going to give rise to more and more extreme weather conditions and with major impact on, on health also. And we still have um, not only demographic growth, but particularly um, aging of the population, and I'll come back to that. And overall, there's growing interdependence um, or globalization, if you want. And this globalization is having a real impact on health. I mean, in terms of globalization of pathogens, I mean, I mentioned the emerging infections, and what took um, perhaps um, several days or weeks for a virus to spread today, that's a matter of an overnight flight from here, uh, from whenever in the world to, say, to Boston. But also, there is a globalization of lifestyles. I mentioned tobacco, but also um, diet. I mean, the uh, um, unhealthy diets are spreading like wildfire, driven by the need for to feed billions of people with cheap food. Um, and, uh, and then we also have the globalization of the ways of transport of individual cars. Migration is continuing and uh, will continue um, uh, under pull and push uh, factors. This globalization of technology, social media, this generation is what's called uh, Generation We, W-E, because of the connectedness of uh, young people throughout the world. But also medical technology is globalizing in a very, a very rapid way and even healthcare provision. And I would, should say also social movements such as the AIDS movement are, um, are a new phenomenon. And there are consequences of this. When you look at the um, wealth, uh, obviously, is a good thing. And um, increasing wealth, definitely, um, with hundreds of millions of people being taken out of poverty. But we are paying now more and more the price of our success. And here you see, for example, the uh, increase in diabetes in Southeast Asia, um, with the, um, at the top, Singapore, um, depending though on the uh, ethnic group in Singapore, but very high rates, which continue to, uh, to increase uh, and uh, will make up really um, a major, major burden for people and the health systems. We're all studying uh, evolution, and is this what uh, is waiting for us? Even if at the same time we still have malnutrition, um, this is what it seems that um, as a species we're um, evolving into. And um, the in December, the so-called global Burden of Disease was published by Chris Murray and his colleagues from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington in Seattle. And they were trying to, um, in a comprehensive way, to estimate what are people dying from and what are the causes of ill health, of healthy life years lost. And um, the, um, 
and comparing 1990 with 2010. It's an exercise that they will now continue to do and that's been done also in many different countries. Now, in terms of causes of death, uh, when we compare 2010 with, um, with, 20, uh, with 1990, um, the top um, four are actually basically the same, ischemic heart disease, stroke, lower respiratory infection, and chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. But um, look at the rest, and that is that um, the, a number of, of the older infectious diseases, they've gone down, like diarrhea, tuberculosis, malaria. Um, HIV has come from nearly from number 35 in 1990 as a cause of death to number 6 uh, in the world. And uh, lung cancer um, has moved from number 8 to number 5, just illustrating the point I, I just made. And it's quite predictable at the rate of uh, smoking in the world and the expansion of smoking in countries like China um, and the rest of Asia, um, lung cancer will probably uh, figure in the top three in the, you know, 10 years from now. Um, but if we look at um, then, sorry, these are complicated slides, but um, they, uh, it's just for, to support my point. If we look at the burden of disease, and it's measured as disability adjusted years lost, um, which is a measure of uh, not only of the mortality, but also of um, healthy lives that are not being enjoyed. Um, we see major, major uh, changes between 1990 and, 90, and 2010. And that is that um, various uh, chronic diseases, non-infectious diseases, are now um, rising to the top. And um, with um, um, ischemic heart disease, um, stroke, lower back pain, for example, uh, COPD and so on, being um, coming up. And what it tells us is that um, also that there are enormous differences, and, and no excuse for this um, complex slide, but on the one hand you've got various regions in the world and then the, uh, the causes of uh, ill health, and, uh, and they're very, very different. And they're also different by age, um, what we know already, I mean, and that is that more, we're living longer, but the, the, um, um, the causes of death and all are uh, very different by age. And so what we're seeing is that we're living longer, but we're also having longer years of uh, ill health. So we've added a lot of um, years to our lives, but not necessarily a lot of life to our years. And, uh, and that is, I know, the challenge both for individuals but then also, when you think of um, healthcare systems and healthcare provision, that's where the biggest expenditure is, and that's becoming a major, major uh, source of, um, you know, of expenditure uh, in all countries for both individuals and for the state. In addition to that, something that is did not uh, come up um, very well in this global burden of disease is that. Um, we're at the beginning of, an, of a time bomb, and that's a time bomb of dementia, Alzheimer disease, and so on. Again, fully related to uh, our longer life. And here we are totally um, in the unknown in terms of how to prevent it, and not even to mention what to do about it. For the young people in the room, that's a long way off, but uh, it is going to hit us. And again, in contrast to what is being thought today, um, you know, this is not only a problem for high-income countries. Um, life expectancy is rapidly increasing in about the whole world, except in those countries heavily affected by AIDS. More difficult to estimate and um, really at the beginning is uh, our understanding of the impact of climate change on health. And this is from studies by Andy Haynes and colleagues at our school, but basically um, 
what we are seeing is something that is already known in quite a few countries, but our direct effects like from heat waves um, in Europe, we have done several ones and with lots of deaths as a result, but also indirect um, impacts of, um, you know, of climate change on um, water-related diseases, um, vector-borne diseases, and, and so on. So that's something that uh, where, as a medical profession, there is not much we can do directly. Uh, we can say we need air conditioners and so on, and that's then going to make the climate change even worse, um, and so on. So we, we need to design strategies of mitigation. And here there are some, um, you know, very uh, courageous predictions or scenarios that were made, modeling, modeling until 2085, which I find very courageous. Um, but um, it really shows that the uh, several vector-borne diseases will expand at a lot, uh, at a greater rate than before because of uh, climate change. And um, just a reminder here that. Dengue is, um, was a, uh, is an infection and where we had great hope that a vaccine would control it. Unfortunately, the, um, the trials of a, um, a candidate vaccine showed it was like at the best 30% uh, effective. And it joins a series of um, really um, failed vaccine development um, where we had dengue, we had HIV, we had also well, 18 to 30 percent um, malaria uh, vaccine, also only like 30 percent, and uh, and now recently a TB vaccine, which didn't show any protection. So um, we, I mean, we all had great hopes for these vaccines, and it hasn't come. And the question is also when you have a 30 percent effective vaccine, um, that's not good enough to put on the market or to use. Um, for and we need to continue the research, but we shouldn't count on it. Now, there are things that have uh, where we could have um, achieved, um, you know, much better if it was only a matter of technology. Here, um, polio was supposed to be eliminated already, um, basically ten years ago. Um, that has not happened. And that's not been an issue of um, technology, but an issue of um, peace, war and peace in Afghanistan, um, rumors, um, beliefs, um, and uh, don't forget that um, you know, like uh, in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, 18 people were killed, um, polio workers in Nigeria a few weeks ago, another eight or so. And uh, so, because of a belief that this, among other things, that this is a Western plot um, to sterilize Muslims or whatever. And uh, the response to this is not by giving more information. This goes much deeper. And uh, this is an issue that we, I think, have underestimated in public health, is the um, culture, beliefs, uh, what have you, and the whole context. So it's not only a matter of technology. Okay, so there's a new agenda that is uh, uh, emerging because the world is uh, changing, health patterns are changing, and uh, but the first point for that I would like to make is that we need to deliver the unfinished <coughs> agenda. But then there's a whole new agenda that uh, you know I, I touched upon chronic diseases, mental health. Um, we have now mega cities. A few years ago, we, we reached a, a turning point, which is probably irre irreversible, where half of the world's population is now living in big cities, and that's going to continue. But many of these cities have not adapted their infrastructure to the growing population. On the other hand, it's, these are also opportunities, because in the city, you can reach people much easier, and so on. And, often higher educate, uh, better educated, and so on. Um, now, a point I'd like to make is that NCDs, which is for non-communicable diseases, we can do something about it. It's not that this is a hopeless thing. 
but look at what we can do, what like would be the um, five most important things. And I'm not talking about a bypass or heart transplant and so on, you know, it's that, that's at the end of the, <coughs> but I'm not saying it's too late, but that's where, um, where we, we can only do damage um, control. One is tobacco control. But sales of tobacco, of cigarettes, are increasing in the world because new markets are being taken up by tobacco companies with their lethal um, marketing, particularly in, um, in Asia and Latin America, and particularly with women. Two, um, salt, fat, and alcohol reduction. Three, weight control. Four, physical activity. All these are non-medical types of issues. And, uh, and the fifth one is secondary prevention, like of hypertension, and we can take a pill like it, take an aspirin a day and so on. That's kind of in the medical field. But chronic diseases, we can only deal with them if we have a, a whole of society approach. This goes from designing cities differently, so that people will walk, that there's public transportation and so on, but that's a big issue, a big problem in very um, hot climates. I mean, like the Gulf states, for example, have the, some of the highest rates of diabetes in the world and of obesity now. But because of the temperatures and the climate, it's kind of difficult to say you have to jog to your work. And how do you do that? So we need, we need to look at that from an urban planning perspective, how houses are constructed, but also develop um, you know, incentives for industry to produce healthy and inexpensive food. And being Belgian, also help, uh, tasty food is it. And uh, because we need the, you know, the, the food industry because organic farming is not going to, uh, to feed uh, 8 billion, 9 billion people. So how do we do that? That requires a completely different way of, um, of living. And some of that will have to go through regulation. Look at New York City. I think that's now becoming one of the healthiest um, urban environments. And because of Mayor Bloomberg's uh, draconian interventions on smoking, you can't even smoke in Central Park, um, but also on trans fats, salt reduction, and now recently on the, the big, uh, you know, soft drink, um, you know. And that's, and, and I know there have been many cartoons, people laughing at it and so on, but um, it's, we'll need uh, this kind of interventions to basically save our, uh, you know, our, um, our species. Um, and some of that um, has been quite successful. For example, in the UK, um, over about 50 years, the average intake of salt has gone down tremendously. And it was done in a very stealth way. So that, um, because these sugar and salt are addictive. And if you would suddenly drop, let's say, all salt from bread and all that, because we eat a lot of bread, um, people wouldn't buy that. But just by gradually reducing salt, people didn't even notice. Um, and, uh, and then there's another issue where there's a total failure at the moment, and that is the enormous damage of alcohol, and particularly binge drinking, which we also see in the UK, uh, and not only in young people, but everywhere, is that um, in Eastern Europe, there is really, it's the region where uh, life expectancy has declined, not gone up, um, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, and um, with, uh, with alcohol being one of the major uh, responsible factors. Moving now to another area that um, for the for global health agenda, and that is the um, very controversial one in this country, but that is the whole issue of universal coverage and access. It's becoming a movement, and of course just universal coverage is not enough. It could be universal coverage of homeopathy or things that are useless. Now, it has to be of quality uh, you know, uh, medical care, and uh, the problem is that regardless of the, the nature of the system, who finances it, um, 
we're becoming quite insolvent and we need a different way of delivering it that we that's not yet clear it's not my um, you know my specialty but certainly where we can uh, and, and have made uh, progress is on access of new technologies new tools that are still under patent to populations in poorer countries and here the um, the AIDS movement has shown the way, uh, but in 1996, uh, AIDS, uh, HIV infection, became a treatable condition. Um, the biggest um, challenge was to uh, make it affordable. The price was, uh, this is for Uganda, you see in 1998, a um, one-year course of antiretroviral therapy, anti-HIV treatment, uh, cost twelve thousand dollars. Today it's about uh, you can get the same drugs basically for two hundred dollars at a bit lower, and that went uh, through a whole process um, where um, through um, let's say health diplomacy, activism, and also uh, changing the rules of the um, of the uh, intellectual property protection, the TRIPS agreements through the World Trade Organization and also the appearance of um, competition from generic manufacturers, particularly in, from, uh, from India, which now um, accounts for about 70-80% of the market in, uh, in, in Africa, of the antiretroviral market. Um, and uh, you can see that um, it is possible to, uh, to change a paradigm. Because the paradigm until then was that a drug that's under patent cannot be made available as a generic anywhere in the world. That was the, the dogma, that was the international law even. Uh, but that was changed under pressure of uh, the AIDS epidemic, the drama of it, activism, and then also, I think, smart uh, politics. Well, we talk a lot about innovation, and we, we would innovate ourselves out of the crisis, we will innovate uh, to end poverty and so on, but can innovation be delivered in poor countries? When you look at um, just at health, you wonder sometimes whether it's possible. But look at the rest, you know, this is just a case from Tanzania, and I found this on a, a website that's called africanspace.co.uk, which is also interesting, the African Space Trust. And you go in a typical village in Tanzania, many don't have electricity, low coverage, generators, high cost of fuel, and an occasional solar panel, which would be the innovation. But you enter any bar and what are, you see mega screens where they're following the British football soccer competition. Um, you know, I see you're, you've been in Tanzania, so you've seen it. Um, with a now enormous early high uh, mobile phone coverage and also um, a high um, use of mobile phones. So innovation can be done, but we haven't really uh, used it at the moment up to now for, for health. And that is possible. So that's the technological innovation. But then there's also innovation in terms of delivering programs. And here in Latin America has a lot of offer. Latin America uh, has initiated several um, very well evaluated um, cash transfer programs, social and uh, health programs, and this is from um, you know from Brazil, where um, families would get cash transfers for uh, to increase their immunization and nutrition status. And finally, I would say that nothing for the people without the people. And um, it is uh, really key, uh, it's something that, again, the AIDS movement has shown, because if we have made such good progress in, in, in AIDS, it was because um, science and politics and people movement found each other. Alex, you, you describe it in your book, you know, Alex Duval, and, uh, um, you know, and it's, it's not only about, uh, it's about power relations, fundamentally. And, and I think that's something that we could use more in, um, you know, for other health uh, and social issues. And this is a, a demonstration of people living with HIV in South Africa. 
And I'd like to end and say a few words about the how, because the, the what is changing, but also the how. But when you take a bit of a historic perspective, you know, um, for global health, global health is a term I couldn't find um, any reference to it before 2000. Uh, and, and I still am trying to find out when was it used for the first time. But it's a new concept, um, and it's a nice concept. Um, because when you look at the history, tropical medicine, like the school I'm heading, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, you couldn't think of a more archaic a title, but it does, then it becomes charming when it's so archaic. But it's rooted in, um, you know, in a number of um, similar institutions in the colonial times of the 19th century. Like in this country, for example, Tulane, well, it just had its 100th anniversary. It's usually based in, 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 in port cities and so on. Anyway, colonial time over, good. We go into the Cold War and, we, and the term international health and geographic health um, or medicine uh, appear. And that's like international, that's there. Um, and then we see an explosion of development aid and, uh, um, and also driven by the, uh, the AIDS epidemic or the AIDS response and that's uh, the term global health pops up. I call it global health 3.0 and now I feel that we're moving into a new um, uh, you know, area and that's one of global health 4.0 which is linked to globalization and also to the fact that there are now we're going more and more into a multipolar world with centers of excellence a bit everywhere. Um, we've seen an explosion of global health programs. Every university that respects itself as a global health something. Um, and in the middle you see the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which have, you know, um, spends now basically more money per year on, on health than the World Health Organization. And new funding mechanisms. This is a global fund with its new executive director, Mark Daigle, who also was um, the global AIDS coordinator heading PEPFAR. Um, a funding mechanism that was put outside the regular ones, uh, outside um, you know the World Bank, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, etc. And Gavi is another example for immunization. But when you look at these global health institutes, they're not really global. When you Google and you see who has the name Global Health, in, they're all in North America, Western Europe, there's one in Japan and a few in Australia, and there's one in Peru. That's it. No, uh, I couldn't find a, an institution in low and middle income countries that bears the word at the name Global Health in it. And um, that's still a reflection of the 20th century, I would say. And uh, what we're moving into is um, a, a different paradigm. And a paradigm where um, we see that slowly moving, where the PI, the, the uh, principal investigator of a uh, research program, I'm talking about research now, it is moving, and you see more and more coming from certainly Asia. Um, and let's not forget, for example, that today, the fastest growing production in science is coming from Asia, from China, from Singapore, India, uh, South Korea, uh, and Brazil. Brazil's <coughs> R&D budget today is larger than that of the UK. And last year it might pass. So that's a new type of world order. The US is still number one. Don't worry. Um, now, we also... Um, Till Friday, yeah. We, all, <laughs> uh, we also uh, see a change in, in language. People still are talking about my study site in Uganda or something like that, which is not really very respectful for um, the partners that we work with. And uh, so what we're seeing now is a, a partnerships of centers of excellence. A third. Um, development is that up to now uh, global health was largely biomedical in its um, emphasis. We see today that it's more and more multidisciplinary. 
like the class, you know, of this afternoon, multidisciplinary, and that's what we need. Um, so there are more disciplines that are being involved in. Um, and that's, you know, as I mentioned here, that moving from infectious diseases and maternal and child health nutrition, we go to broad health issues. It's also interesting that uh, we now have, um, if you take the, um, the terminology of drug discovery, of, of drug development from discovery to, uh, to delivery, that before all the drugs were discovered, the new drugs were either in, you know, in the West or in Japan. Today we see uh, new original um, discoveries emerging, in, particularly in Asia. But recently, um, South Africa, a group at the University of Cape Town, developed the first um, new anti-malaria compound developed on African soil. So these things are also new. Uh, it's no longer our test fields, but it's also contributing to global um, knowledge and, um, and innovation. And I would say also we see a, 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 a switch from um, delivery of innovation. Something is new, newly developed innovation, say in the US, and we're going to test it out in whatever, in Zambia, Cambodia. Um, but it's also innovation of delivery, new ways of um, delivering, um, you know, uh, health uh, aspects, going outside the classic uh, medical uh, facilities. And finally, I, I, I hear far less the word brain drain these days. We have another look at it. Of course, myself, I'm an immigrant and immigrant, so I have a conflict of interest here, but, um, you know, we talk about more and more about circular migration. And people move from here to there, and in the end, um, that can be beneficial for, um, for many uh, societies. So I'd like to end here and say that we are in an uh, an area that I think is one of the grand challenges of our time, like with climate change and, and, uh, and peace, um, and that um, the, there's a great future for working in global health, but we need to become truly global in, uh, in how we approach it, and that means global in our um, the disciplines that are involved, global in the scope, how we work together as partnerships, and global in terms of making sure we capture all the health problems of, uh, you know, that we are confronted with today and in the future. Thank you so much again. For your
uh, untreatable as it was then, sexually transmitted disease would have been the pretext for every government in the world to introduce restrictive measures. And in fact, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it even provides exemptions on basic human rights in the case of infectious diseases. And I don't think there's a, I cannot think of another case where an infectious disease, let alone one with those characteristics, actually became the occasion for an expansion in human rights discourse around the world, an expansion in the rights of, 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 of people living uh, with, a, with a disease, the rights of minorities, the involvement of civil society. It's never, I believe, happened before. And I think a huge amount of the credit actually belongs to, to you, Peter, for, for for that, I think it's a, an under-acknowledged achievement. I think our, our focus on, 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 on the medical and public health ignores that, uh, that very important, if you like, innovation in the inclusive uh, governance of public health. And, 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 and I'd like to emphasize that because I think this is, um, your, your mention of the, the, the whole of society approach, all the issues that you dwelt on then would benefit from that type of approach. There are enormous technocratic innovations, and we mentioned in, 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 in New York, which are, which are having measurable effects. They will be sustainable, they will be accelerated, they will be greater if they are subject to that kind of inclusive uh, public health government, so I, 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 I would argue. That's my main point. I want to just make two other small points. One is to ask um, whether you see uh, enormous changes, game changes coming from genomics or, or synthetic biology and the types of, of uh, uh, nutritional innovation that are now being made possible by, uh, by, by synthetic biology. Um, and then the last point um, on, on, on relating to you, um, the, the case you mentioned of, of, of uh, people who, who are uh, working in polio eradication being uh, being killed. Um, you say we don't we underestimate the significance of culture and beliefs. I, I, I would posit actually that we that that's true, but I think that we also underestimate the way in which the, the current global political and economic system is producing at its margins, at the margins of the developed world in places like the Saharan countries, in many parts of Africa, in, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Yemen, also maybe in, even in the Philippines and in Mexico and so on, um, systems that don't produce public goods. They only produce private goods. They are systems that are, are, are fundamentally uh, corrupted by uh, the, the importance of trafficking networks, of criminal incomes, and so on. And if you have a political system that produces no public goods at all, and you try and introduce a public good like healthcare into it, it becomes part of this incessant political positioning and bargaining and patronage system um, that we see in, 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 in countries like Congo, which you know very well. And, 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 and so I would, I, I would say that there needs to be um, the, that in, is, is perhaps symptomatic of the political decay of many of these countries, and we need to um, address that um, those failures of governments at their root, which is not the root actually in the country itself, but the root in the way they're integrated into a, a global system. Um, but once again, thank you uh, very much indeed for that tremendously stimulating. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I couldn't agree more with your last point, your third point. And uh, well, that, that would be a, actually a, a very good topic for even a symposium or for at least a, a good debate. Um, what does it mean for, for health issues? You know, because I think that's underappreciated. And, and what's going on at the moment in, um, you know, in the Sahel and so on, which I think is only the beginning. Um, and, and could be could go into that direction as well. On your um, question about the potential of genomics and synthetic biology and so on for, well, let's say to solve the you know, what the nutritional problem or what I think it's I, I honestly don't know. I think for genomics itself um, has been oversold. I think. Um, 
in terms of its uh, immediate impact, I, I believe that it will have an impact, but we, it's not so clear yet. You know, let's not forget that the ENCODE project published its uh, results only um, well, it was in November or something like that, in nature. Um, so we are still, um, I mean, we, the scientific community, is still really digging into what what we do with it. What, what strikes me, though, is that is the proliferation already of um, you know companies that uh, you know where you can have your own se genome more or less sequenced and so on. So, but in terms of therapeutic applications, it probably will be very important for particularly in oncology and so on for food production. I honestly don't know, um, but uh, we, um, yeah, and I don't know enough about synthetic biology, so it's, you're taking, I don't know. I think that you can always say the potential is enormous, but that's, uh, yeah, that's not an answer. But, I, but it seems to me that the, um, um, the improvement of uh, agricultural techniques and food production is really key. Uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, much progress has been made uh, in that area, in, in, uh, including now in, in, in Africa. But uh, that's, it's not only a matter of new crops, but also of better um, mechanisms for bringing the products uh, or the food to the, to the markets. The, the loss of food um, in the, the chain from production to customer is the consumer is just enormous in some places and that I find also um, as very very much neglected and under resourced and sometimes is linked to the same thing that we said before it is no security no infrastructure no public good kind of uh, uh, environment the way we have some time for question what is uh, How are you? a few you <laughs> so, if you have a question, please stand up and just project your voice. We don't have a microphone. Emily? Hi, my name is Emily, um, and I'm the senior in the ethics program. Um, and from what, what our class rep is doing today, um, I was really intrigued by um, in the work that you did in the NCIR and LCRC and um, in tracking down the Ebola virus um, and working with people who are actually getting infected at the time, uh, particularly with 1976, um, at a time when so much of the world, um, and especially from Western Europe and our country as well, was extremely racist. Um, I was wondering how you were able to um, use your experiences on the ground and um, convey to the first world, what we now call um, you know, developed countries, how you're able to um, convince people in power uh, the cultural complexities of the people you've worked with, um, and how you have been able to humanize people in order to make programs work, um, and also whether or not you think that the discourse about Africans um, and about some of the world's poorest people, especially people of color, how that's changed over the time that you've been in position of power. Oof, that's a, all very good questions, but there are many, so let me try a few. No, 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 sorry, they're very good. Actually, I would like to come to the first point that Alex made, because um, I could, um, uh, about the involvement of people, you know, who are, um, Concern me. If I, I could sell this in a, as a political, scientific uh, thing, that it was a very strategic thing, and that uh, you know, and that I thought it through and all that. To be honest, for me, it was a no-brainer. It said that's the way to go. And I, uh, when I negotiated the um, membership of the board of uh, of UNAIDS in uh, ECOSOC, I never heard of ECOSOC by the way, but uh, with diplomats, I said we cannot do this without the people who are, you know, affected. For me, it was not based on something that I was, uh, you know, had thought about a lot. It was just, for me, that's it. And, uh, and I think it's a good principle. I mean, uh, either as a um, 
from a business perspective, no consumer company would, um, you know, uh, would start with, with the market, would start a new product on the market okay, uh, without at least talking to the potential consumers. In, in public policy, we don't do that. We just have a bunch of experts coming together and see what is cost effective or whatever. But, but of course, consumer companies, they don't Unilever and all that, they don't have the, you know, they don't have babies on the, on the board. But anyway, so I think that was one of the ways, for me, it's a, I have to say, it's a, a non-brainer to do it. And one of, what did I do? Um, a lot of small things. Um, wherever I would uh, go and, and, and visit countries, I would always insist to have a meeting with people on the ground um, who are yeah, people living with HIV, that could be sex workers, could be drug users. That sometimes caused quite a lot of consternation because I was in a position where my visits would be official visits and with state protocol and so on. And then you say, I want to meet with these people there and so on. I said, no, you can't do that. But I said, sorry, that's what I do. And uh, But not making a big point of it, but just saying, that's what I do. And I think that sends a message. And then I could, and I tried to do that at the beginning of a visit, before I would see, let's say, a president or prime minister, and I could say, look, I could be then the, the voice of the ones without a voice, um, bring people to, or I, I had, what we, we organized that, uh, the, the, the General Assembly of the United Nations. Um, but people living with HIV, a gay man, a sex worker, etc., they, they would speak there, they would address them, and, uh, and the roof didn't fall in, you know. Um, but that was, I, I think it's by, um, by creating facts and by also uh, bringing people to the table, giving a press conference with people around me. So that's, it's kind of classic um, political uh, and communication um, approaches. But on your point about um, whether there's been a change in uh, attitudes to Africa, I honestly don't know. I, I'm, um, I think I've been guilty myself of presenting too much uh, of what's going on in Africa as problems. Um, and um, I, retrospectively, I think I should have also had to, I should have emphasized more the positive side. Probably I was maybe marked by the fact that a lot of my certainly initial experience was in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as it's called now, which is basket case for what Alex just said, you know, of a, how did you call it, a marketplace for, um, you know, for everything is for sale basically, including power. Um, but today, I let's not forget that Africa is a continent that has now the um, highest economic growth um, and which has an enormous potential. As long, I think, as governance is becoming reasonable uh, everywhere. Um, the plagues of corruption um, are really incredibly um, risky for not only for the people but for the world. And when you look at what's in this um, in the soil, you know all the commodities that are being found now, from Ethiopia to you know to Mozambique. That can be a curse, and that can be um, absolutely get Africa out, you know, in, and launch it, and probably it will be something in between. But so, um, so it's a mixture. I, I, I don't know whether it's been a more positive development, but I think so. I, I hope so. I think there was uh, someone you there. Uh, yes, please. Thank you for a great talk. I, I want to hear about one other thing we, I didn't hear. Who are you, David? I'm, I'm David Davis. I'm a professor of economics here. Uh, and a friend of Sherman. The uh, air, air and non-microbial water pollution, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, problems lately where, you know, living in Beijing was like being in the Hong Kong smokers' lounge. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, 
maybe from the you know, London or Bog of the early 50s or something, we have some epidemiological basis for saying how much of a public health problem this might be if it you know, persists uh, you know, every winter. Uh, and uh, you know, how, how much of a health problem is this? You, you mentioned Vegas disease, but you didn't specify air and non-microbial water. Yes, well, it's both uh, water pollution and, and air pollution. And, um, <coughs> um, well, and China is obvious, and, and it's just one anecdote. One, not only. No, not only. Uh, uh, one day I, I drove uh, hundreds of kilometers through um, uh, Shanxi province, and uh, not the one where Xi'an is, but the other one, I can't remember. And there's lots of uh, small coal mines and a uh, lot of Small industry and um, um, you know, and steel industry, and you can't see the sky ever. It's just so polluted. So then I had dinner with the governor of the province, and uh, who was uh, enthusiastically, you know, um, smoking, and, uh, I, and I benefited from that as well. Was, uh, <laughs> my face, you know, and uh, and I said, you know, uh, Excellency. Uh, we must have a lot of respiratory problems here with this. I couldn't see. He said, no, why? I mean, through a translator. And um, no, there is a, um, I, I think, an enormous um, impact on health of, um, of this kind of pollution of all kinds, which is still not very um, uncovered. Because it's a cover-up to start with, um, which was also the case in, in you know, in our cities now, in London, uh, some colleagues from our school estimated uh, how many people are killed every year because of the, um, the pollution that we have in London. Although it's no longer the smog of the, of the 50s, which shows that it can be reversed. Um, but the, the air is still not clean enough that it's not a risk for, um, for individuals. And, and, that, and I think we, we will probably learn more about that as we refine <coughs> measurement of all kinds of um, pollutants, maybe cadmium, whatever, you know, uh, there's no, um, so that is, a, yeah, it's an area that I, I agree, I mean, it, and it, it probably will be um, getting worse also with growing uh, urbanization, growing population, and then, you know, the continuous um, to say production or all kinds of things. No, I'm. Oh, it's a very good point. Thank you. Who was uh, there? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Rosa Virginia. Um, my question is: um, with so much concern about the impact of Yeah, well, the, the, the influence is not only negative. I mean, I think that um, when you look today, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, um, if you take the, um, the achievements in fight against AIDS and, and malaria, particularly these two, um, that is largely um, with um, American taxpayers' money. And, uh, you know, that has saved millions of lives. So that's the positive side. On the negative side, but that's not only America, but it's also Europe, is this um, the spread of a lifestyle and of um, uh, of like um, food that is unhealthy. Uh, now, um, it's it's more it's driven by um, yeah I think by the fact that these are uh, easy to produce um, food that's, and that's and people like it, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a, um, it, I was wondering whether we couldn't do something like of the kind of that, taking New York City as an example, and rather than try to change things at the level of uh, countries, but bringing cities together. 
you know, and mayors to mayors that may be more um, of a realistic um, scale and level um, and say, look, we don't have to wait until um, the big food manufacturers uh, change their products or the national laws are changed, but uh, let's start in our cities, something like that. So that could be a, a positive influence. But, uh, you know, let's not forget that until when, maybe 10 years, 20 years ago, you would see in many films and TV shows and so on, you know, they're, they're all smoking. Look at the number of, uh, if you look at old, these black and white uh, photos of movie stars, you know, the cool thing was to have a, a cigarette that's finished. So it, it's, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't have an answer, but, um, but it shows, the, again, the globalization of it. And particularly, the U.S. dominates, to a large extent, the cultural sector. Now, Hollywood and all that. Though not completely. I mean, there are world-famous movie stars from Bollywood, but that are only known in uh, India and etc. and vice versa. There are no universal or hardly any universal uh, icons uh, in this area. So we, we need to think also of, of them. What are the, the role models? Let's take one more, or two more, and then we... Sorry, I'm a bit jet lag, to be honest. So, yeah. My name is Demi, and I'm now asking the IDF Medical Corp. I wanted to ask you about the new age uh, behavior in the well-educated modern uh, population in the city, uh, that uh, not vaccinated their children because, because of their beliefs. It's harmful for them, and it makes uh, diseases uh, the best way to raise their head, like measles. Yeah. What are the tactics to do that? Yeah, no, that's a, a big issue, I think, and, and paradoxically in the future, maybe becoming uh, more of a problem. I mean, the irony is that in 2012 we have worse immunization levels in most Western countries than when I was a kid or than when my kids were kids, you know, and, uh, and, and that's, um, and it also is, defeats the, the classic, um, relationship between education, wealth, and good health, or good health practices, because it's often those who are better off, have a college education and so on, who are not immunizing their, their children. And we see indeed outbreaks, measles, uh, all over Europe, but uh, also other uh, diseases. And I was thinking of something, you know, um, well, it's not enough to provide more information. We need to understand why, why that is going on. I mean, we had, I gave the example of polio. Okay, we can laugh at it, but it's part of people's lives, you know, of what they believe. Here it is, I think, a combination of the one hand being quite selfish and say, okay, if uh, other kids are all vaccinated and mine are not uh, at risk, so we let them, let others run the risk. Um, that is frankly antisocial behavior, um, but um, but it doesn't work. And the ones that maybe could be the the agents for change could be grandmothers. I was thinking, you know, if the kids are getting measles, are not infected, older people with waning uh, protection and immune and immune systems and uh, immune protection against the childhood diseases. They may get, you know, be exposed and, and get all kinds of diseases that uh, and infections that are, um, and so if all grandmothers say from now on I refuse to babysit for the grandkids that are not immunized, that may be uh, more effective than uh, asking to do this in school. I mean, just as a maybe crazy idea, but uh, no, I, I think we underestimate it and we need to think through and we need, um, and I think it's not only a matter for. Um, public health professions, but also we need to, to know, uh, to understand what they're doing. We need to have people who are good at communication, marketing and all that, and, and um, yeah. Because now when you hear that in, like in, in my circles of public health people, it's kind of just give them more information, or they don't understand. They understand very well, particularly the, the, the higher educated, and they know every single side effect. There are, there's of course, there are also the conspiracy theory groups. I mean, like uh, with Wakefield and it's autism and so on, and it's not supported by any evidence. 
but it's extremely hard to convince them, you know. And the problem is that we have pediatricians who are saying the same things, which is kind of actually, we need some lawsuits for malpractice. If a pediatrician or whoever didn't give um, the necessary vaccines and the, in some kid develops, let's say, encephalitis through uh, measles, I mean, let's look at that also. I think we need to become at the same time tougher, but also on more understanding what uh, what's behind it. And then, um, but it's a, becoming a worldwide phenomenon. That's the downside, if you want, of uh, social media and so on. You know, something these groups are organized and they're getting also money. Would be also interesting to follow the money as always. Where is the support coming for these groups? Because they have money. So, uh, well, thanks for asking the question. Last, not least. <laughs> Observation connecting to uh, Jean Mayer Award and then a, a question. Uh, I think the, the point that Alice DeWalls made about, about the enormous importance of, of focusing uh, some of the efforts in, in disease control or, or uh, these or progress on, on the people. And in engaging them uh, it is a, a very important one, and I just I can't help but remind you that when Jean Mayer was the, the director of the White House Conference on uh, on Nutrition in 1969, the only one we've ever had in this country, he organized it in a way uh, that there was great prominence. Of, of people uh, who who were who were in that uh, segment of society where they were suffering from hunger and, and sometimes malnutrition, and there could have been a photograph at that time, uh, just like the photograph you showed of the women uh, with AIDS, uh, of people uh, with signs saying "Bread Now." Uh, I think that that so this connection, I think. Uh, enormously meaningful uh, to me. Uh, uh, just a, a, a question. The, the remarkable uh, trajectory uh, of, of the cost of AIDS drugs and, and therefore uh, the, uh, the ability to, to make uh, retrovirals uh, available to, to a huge uh, uh, increase in the, in the number of people. Uh, what was uh, what, 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 what are the lessons to be learned from that? Uh, uh, is that is that all about uh, uh, the way in which you know public private engagement occurred and, and so forth? With, uh, how can that how can that trajectory be uh, repeated uh, with all kinds of uh, treatments and interventions? Yeah, I'm not sure it can be repeated, but I think it opened doors. It's, um, I think the first lesson is that it's possible to do, because uh, I have some slides where it says that um, um, by some famous economists, and they say that it's uh, unthinkable <coughs> that um, uh, antiretroviral therapy will become available for, this was particularly about, specifically about Africa, because um, the shareholders of pharmaceutical companies will not be willing to do this, etc. And taxpayers in wealthy countries will not be willing to pay for it because it involved. And um, so it's possible. Secondly, um, I think it's um, we, we used um, a, a combined attack, you know, of many different changing international law on trips was one aspect not so sexy and so on, but a lot of work and I, I had to learn more about it than I ever wanted to. Um, activism, I mean, you had a film here about ACT UP and so on, I mean, it's, that was one thing. Negotiations also um, with the pharmaceutical companies uh, struggling with a, 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 a reputational issue. 
um, and um, and finding solutions. Um, so we never asked to abolish intellectual property, nor to a protection, nor to um, give it away for free. And so, um, but I think it was a combination of activism and uh, helping to find the, the legal and commercial um, solutions and have an alternative also. We were very fortunate that um, India changed its patent law in the 98, something like that, which made it possible for Indian companies to, to, well, to just change a little bit the production process and, and they said it's an original product. And at the same time also Indian companies went global up to then they had concentrated on their internal market, which of course is huge. Uh, so they went global. It was the globalization of the Indian pharmaceutical company. So there were many things that happened at the same time. And also, um, because of the prominence of, uh, of AIDS in the, in the public sphere and at the highest political levels, um, that accelerated things. So it's, I, the stars got aligned uh, suddenly in a way that I'm not sure will happen before, uh, later, still uh, now, but, um, but once you have a precedent, it's possible to do. And we just, but what is really important is that you have a unified movement to deal with that. And that's what you need state, where you need a group of people who pay attention to every single of these aspects in a coordinated way. And also what we sometimes did was coordinate with activists. You know, um, even if they would attack me and say that I'm not doing enough, etc., I agreed with that. But you know, we each have our role and what we can do. Um, and now we have to think: what would be, how would we use that expertise for other areas? And that's, yeah, that's what I'm interested in. That's one of the reasons I moved to the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, so that uh, where we deal with many other uh, health issues and. Uh, and also to um, yeah transfer that experience to younger generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and thanks for your thoughtful questions. I want to say thank you one more time to Professor Duval for bringing us Dr. Piot, and also obviously for being an integral part of our class in the fall. And Dr. Pia, thank you so much for this really amazing culmination to our symposium. So thanks and have a good night, everyone.